Hello and welcome to episode 81 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast. And for those of you who are listening for the very first time, my name is Julian Carl and I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Synergen Group. So I'm passionate about all things leadership and management. So passionate, in fact, that I decided to start a podcast about it. And here we are, midway through season two, and my purpose for the podcast continues to be the same, to raise the standard of leadership. So in today's show, I speak with Lynn Kazali, who is the author of Ish, The Problem with Our Pursuit of Perfection and the Life-Changing Practice of Good Enough. Lynn is obsessed with helping leaders lead their teams through transformation and change. It's about business agility, about helping people apply their ideas and adapting to what happens when those ideas are put to practice. Leaders become more capable, boost engagement with their staff and make decisions quicker. Lynn has delivered keynotes, workshops and sessions for leaders globally, including Europe, USA, Asia and New Zealand and is also the author of another six books on top of the book we're going to be chatting about today. She's also an experienced board director and chair and has worked with clients such as Bupa, ME Bank, Microsoft, Zendesk, Nestle, TAC, NAB, Metro Trains, Commonwealth Bank and the Western Bulldogs AFL team. So now during the course of the conversation, we explore Lynn's book in detail. I start off by asking Lynn, why did she decide to write this book? We speak about the types of perfection and the impacts they can have on us. We discuss the change from default thinking to direct thinking and why this is such an important aspect of leadership. And I finish the interview by asking Lynn about why perfection is on the rise and what we can do about it. So keep listening. As always, really like to hear your thoughts about the interview with Lynn Kazali, author of Ish, The Problem with Our Pursuit for Perfection and the Life-Changing Practice of Good Enough. Happy listening. Welcome to the Synergen Leadership Podcast with Julian Carl. Julian returns in 2019 with weekly conversations with leaders and authors from Australia and around the world, giving you the opportunity to share in their journey and learn from their expertise and knowledge. Julian also shares some of the tools and techniques he uses as a leader, mentor, and facilitator, helping you to build your leadership capability and improve your confidence as a leader. Welcome, Lynn, to the Synergen Leadership Podcast. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time specifically to come out to Synergen HQ. I always think that's a a great thing. So that the listeners have a bit of an idea about uh, who you are, who is Lynn Kazali? Who is Lynn Kazali? Well, often in, in Australia, the name Kazali is quite famous. Internationally, maybe not, but Kazali was a famous footballer, yeah. Australian rules footballer last century. So Roy Kazali was my great great uncle. Right. So sometimes it's good to get that out of the way first. Okay. You know, so the pedigree, the pedigree yeah, is there. Yeah. So a great uh, innovative sportsman he was, yeah. but he also had some quite slapdash make it up as you go along training techniques before banned substances were <laughs> being used. Uh, and I think I've carried on his some of those traits of innovation and thinking. So, okay. yeah. so I run my own uh, business or practice in basically in communications consulting, uh, but also a background in in-house roles, lecturing at uni, a um, bit of broadcasting experience and facilitating and training. Great. So we're here today to uh, talk about your your book, Ish, The Problem with Our Pursuit for Perfection and the Life-Changing Practice of Good Enough. Why did you decide to write this book? I'd written a, a few books before it, but it was the immediate one prior, which was about agile ways of working. So I've done a lot of work with software developers and tech teams, helping them work better together. And I learned a lot of things from them. The main one is that they release software and apps in the very early stages of development. They don't wait until anything's finished. So I wrote the book called Agile-ish because I really love the unorthodox way of you don't have to follow the exact principles of Agile to be Agile. It's a mindset thing. And then after that book was out there for a while, I thought, it's actually the ish bit that I'm about. So the the book just started to happen from all of my thinking and experience. It's like all of your life starts yeah. to contribute to something, and and this is it. I'm, I put my hand up. I'm a reformed perfectionist. <laughs> so this is a little bit of my story and how I've how I've reformed myself. Okay. Well, I'd like to start with a with a bit of an excerpt. We often have this belief that it's not ready yet, yet. Whatever it is we want to do with it, share it, send it, 
ship it, sell it, show it, or sometimes to simply tell someone about it, we think there's still work to be done to make it good enough. This is because we've been brought up with cultural, societal and social expectations that place great value on achievement, success and excellence. Striving for perfection is something we've been encouraged to do for most of our lives. So I think that really resonated with me because I know that uh, I can be one of these people that's a little guilty about uh, always wanting things perfect. So Mm -hmm. how did you suddenly come to this realisation that it doesn't need to be perfect? I had some accidental ishes, that's what I'd say. There's this, we ish every day. Like I say, who who hasn't dragged something out of the laundry basket and put it back on when it should have gone into the washing machine? So we ish on things all the time. We have a ish meaning somewhat or near enough and, and we do it accidentally. And so I thought, well, maybe we could do this more deliberately. And so I looked back through some of my experience and, and noticed that I had done some accidental issues. And so I started to do some deliberate ones to see, uh, would anyone notice and would it make a big difference? And the answer was no to both of those. Mm. People don't know you're ishing mm. and in the main it doesn't make a huge difference. Mm. And I suppose it resonated uh, with me because uh, in your book you talk about your first deliberate ish. Mm. And it was a training program. Yes. So yeah. obviously that's what we do. So talk that's to me right. about your uh, your first deliberate ish. Yeah, so running my own practice or business and I, I had heard that it can be good to share the skills and knowledge with other people. So I thought I'll set up a date and book a venue and promote this course and see if anyone turns up. So I, I did all that and sent out some information and waited. Nothing much was happening. So I thought, oh, it's not going to go ahead. But lo and behold, then a few deposits started <laughs> appearing in my bank account yeah. and, and enrolments coming through in the mail. And I went, oh, shit, I'm going to have to run this. Yeah. I'm going to have to do it. And I didn't have a lot of time available. So I cobbled something together and it was awesome in their eyes. Yeah. In my eyes, it wasn't good enough and I could feel the perfectionism biting me. But the participants were just overjoyed it absolutely landed for them so there you are and i think that's the real the thing isn't it uh that is because i can talk to this point specifically about facilitation Mm. is that uh the different perspectives between what the participants see and experience and what you as a facilitator think and quite often there's a significant mismatch so so true because you can think that a session is dying, you know, that it's dull, that it's not working. And because people aren't leaping about in the air or don't have huge smiles on their faces and aren't laughing, but actually they're deeply engaged, they're thinking, they're processing information. And so you could be reading that wrong. Your perception could be skewed and distorted and it's not the truth. Hmm. So you talk about this idea of transitioning from not good enough mm. to good enough. Mm. So are you able to, and you know, I do want to give you a bit of credit too, this, this book is a little different when you see it visually. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's things in different orders and sort of sides <clears throat> and different script. It's actually quite an interesting book visually to, to look yeah. at. So are you able to sort of talk to the listeners about this idea of transitioning from not good enough to good enough. Yeah, a little bit like a ladder. And if you divided that ladder into a top half and a bottom half, then down in the bottom half, the depths, not such a good place to be is where we feel we're not good enough and, and we do feel worse about ourselves. And that that area is whenever we're going for perfection. And so we're usually in uh, doing things like procrastinating, uh, rejecting our own ideas or rejecting the ideas of others and we've, we're striving for perfectionism. And so that's all in that bottom half of the ladder and we continue to feel like crap. Mm. And so we have to get out of that place and get up into what I call some more clear air, get up a bit yeah. higher, where we're pursuing progress instead of perfection and this is where you start to feel good enough. Mm. And we feel better about ourselves because a few things are happening. First of all, if you work in increments, so you're getting things done and and humans are hugely motivated by progress. So to be able to tick things off, how good does that feel? Mm. So if you work in increments and accept or tolerate your imperfections, you can then work in iterations, that is make your first draft better 
uh, put it out again, make it the third draft, the fourth version, the fifth version. And so iterations is one of those things from the software world that helps them make great progress. The first pancake is always lumpy. That's yeah. a that Russian saying. Yeah. Um, and and we can't expect perfect on the first cut. So go for iteration over perfection and pursue the progress rather than perfection and you'll feel much better about yourself. Mm. And I, I suppose yeah, that's, your, that's, I suppose, supported by this idea of the good enough space, mm. which is where people make that deliberate decision to stop pursuing perfection and, and instead pursue progress. Yeah. How do they how do they fight that inner thing, that voice which is telling them, no, 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 it's got to be perfect. How do they fight that? Um, I don't know if, if I would want to fight it, but maybe <laughs> call it out or challenge it or question it. Yep. And and that, that can be our ego saying, no, you look like a fool, you know, you'll be embarrassed, that's not the right thing to do, you can do better than this. And, and as soon as you find yourself in that space of thinking in this automated way, because it's habitual and it's generational, so it's likely been passed on to you and it was passed on to your parents and their parents, it goes back, it'll go back a fair way, um, that we can start thinking more about will this thing be fit for purpose? What, what's, what do I need this thing for, this project or task or activity? and to make it good enough for the job to be done. Mm. Okay. There's a, there was a statement I read, uh, which I, I thought I wanted to explore, which is perfection doesn't exist, so it's impossible to reach. So why do we keep trying to reach it if, it's, <laughs> if it doesn't exist? <laughs> uh, we're often what's known as over-functioning. So we're trying to do things to feel better about ourselves and feel better about what we're doing. So some of this stems from early our early years. Maybe a teacher you know, looked at us with a condescending glance or a, a negative comment. Um, maybe things are a bit chaotic for us growing up as kids. And so these perfectionists are you know, going for perfect are the overcompensating behaviours, that if I do good, I will be accepted, I'll be recognised, I'll be loved. Mm. Um, it's kind of as simple and as difficult as that. Okay. I, I liked uh, we gave a bit of a, a breakdown of the different types of perfectionism mm. because I think that what it does is it allows the, the readers to sort of maybe categorise themselves a little bit and give them a bit of a framework to operate in, and I'm always a big fan of that. So are you able to, to, to share what those sort of types are? Mm. So this is from Curran and Hill, who are two PhD researchers. They've done uh, research over 20, 30 years of over about 40,000 people, and they identified these three types of perfectionism. And so you can see you might you might be a, a victim of, of one or more or you might be kind of a perpetrator of, of them. So the first one is self-oriented perfectionism. This is I hold myself to very high standards, right? It's where we okay. set incredibly high standards for ourselves. The second is socially prescribed. So this is when we perceive that society expects X, Y, Z from us. Okay. So we think, oh, I couldn't do that because it wouldn't be acceptable or it wouldn't be tolerated or it wouldn't be allowed. We don't know who's actually saying that, but it's it's usually a perception and it may not be true. And then the third one is other-oriented. This is where we have high standards for others. So we start to impose our perfectionism lens on other people and what they're doing. So mm -hmm. self societal and others. Mm. I actually think there's a real lesson there as you were, as you were talking about them for leaders in particular because if, if we're putting those uh, perfectionism on others, that can potentially damage the leadership relationship that we have with the people in our teams. Yeah, I think it's one of the big contributors to that, the toxic workplace mm -hmm. culture stuff that's, that is so prevalent and perhaps not a lot of people talk about it. And it's certainly about what's contributing to psychologically unsafe workplaces yeah. is that perfectionist bosses, and I, I talk in here about the boss that I had, and I think most of us have probably worked with or, or 
done something with a perfectionist kind of boss or leader and nothing's ever good enough. They love the red pen. Uh, you're, you're working on relentless versions of something and things never go live and you never celebrate the wins and the team feels deflated. Morale starts to drop and that saying of people leave leaders, not organisations, mm. this is what happens. You go, I'm not working with them. Or rather it's I'm not working for them because yeah. you feel like a lackey or a minion rather than the more newer ways of working, which are about collaborative, co-created workplaces. They're, they're what I'd call last century leaders. Perfectionism just isn't it isn't needed in the contemporary workplace. No, and we, with, with things changing so fast, uh, if you spend all your time trying to be a perfectionist about at a certain stage, well, it's probably already passed you by anyway. Yeah. So yeah. You, you, you talk about this idea of, of fear mm-hmm. and you ask the, the readers to, to you know, think about what are they afraid of. So what are generally, in your experience, people afraid of with stop, stopping being the perfectionist? Well, some of it is that fear of embarrassment or looking foolish. Yeah. Um, there was uh, I was watching this YouTube video of a guy on a wave, uh, wave board in a wave pool on a cruise ship, right? Mm. So they've got that, that fun activity. And the guy who was on the wave board, he wouldn't let go of the pool attendant. So the, the pool attendant's there to get him up and going, but he wouldn't let go. Mm. And he kept, he kept uh, afloat and moving on riding this wave, but we knew that as soon as he lets go of the pool attendant, mm. Of course, you're going to probably flip off, right? Yeah. Learning. We're learning a new thing. and But just to watch this video, he does not let go. So he doesn't want to look foolish in front of his friends or family. He doesn't want to be embarrassed. Um, bruises the ego. You know, can make us feel like we're less than we are. Mm-hmm. So that's a big thing is the fear of looking foolish. Yeah. Um, I always think it's interesting when you... Because I a lot of our client base are quite industrial, and so right. deal with a lot of a lot of men. And, you know, men don't want to look a certain way, but you you sort of get them one on one, and you ask them, well, what do you do if it's just you and your little grandchild, where there's no judgment, there's no anything? Do you make funny faces? Do you do all those things? And the majority of them say, oh yeah, absolutely. But just change the context, and the fear yeah. just becomes so overpowering. Yeah, that fear of I won't fit in, yeah. and instead I'll stand out, mm. and I'll stand out in a way that's not good, when in fact we need to stand out in ways that line up with you know who we are and what we like to do. Yeah. You, you write about that uh, in many cases we're hoping to prove something. Mm. And you've given a quite a comprehensive list here. Uh, I was wondering if you could just talk to sort of the ones that you you see the most in in the work that you do. Mm. If it's perfect, so these are the sta- statements. If it's perfect, then da 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 da. Yeah. So if it's perfect, it shows I'm clever, right? I'm clever, and and um, therefore you like it's like the quality of my work is being judged, and mm. and I'm being aligned with that. Or if it's if this thing is perfect, then people will believe that's how I do everything, and I am therefore this awesome person in their eyes, and they will accept me and yeah. love me. Um, and if it's perfect, it'll prove that I turned out okay. And that rotten <laughs> teacher at school, you know, who said you will not amount to anything, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll be able to go look. Here I am. Okay. I, I have actually done this. Um, but it, it does come down to people will love me, accept me, and see me. You know this this idea that many of us feel invisible and right. ignored, and so perfectionism can sometimes come out there. Of, of please see what I've done. It's please let me know it's good work. Okay. Yeah. So just to touch on that point for a minute, why do you think that that there's a bit of an undercurrent of that that people feel invisible, and so their default position is trying to appear perfect. The world, the world's cray cray, isn't it? You know, it's, <laughs> just a little. <laughs> the world's crazy. So, and oftentimes we see that people kind of don't give other people the time of day. We're also caught up in our own world. So I think there's something about what could I do that might jolt someone out of their hypnotic state to just take notice of what I've done. 
Now, might someone listen to my story briefly? Might someone acknowledge that I exist? And it all does get back to that stuff. We want to know that we matter. So if I could produce something that's perfect, then maybe people will notice. So you caution the, the readers mm. at one point in the book, say, beware the curse <laughs> of wanting better. That's right. <laughs> What's the curse and the how curse. do we avoid it? Well, the curse of discernment, this is something from psychologist Barry Schwartz. He's written some great stuff and he says, just watch out because our standards, we have a certain standard of what we will tolerate or accept. Mm. And he says, as your life conditions improve, your standards of what you will tolerate or accept <laughs> yeah. also improve. Um, and I say it's like if you've been to a particular cafe or restaurant and you've had a certain standard of meal, mm. then you might expect that the next time and the next time and the next time. And, you know, you see it with people when they're visiting friends. Oh, wow, look at the size of their television, you know. Mm. Okay, now I know that that's possible. We need the same. Mm. So the curse of discernment is beware because even though even when you get it, you probably won't feel you still won't feel good because this zero point, this base point keeps rising as mm. we go through life. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? That, mm. yeah, a, lot, a lot of people also apply that to, to, to their financial situation. Mm. They hit a certain financial target in their career and they hit it and they realise they don't feel any difference and then they put a new financial target on and they hit that. I still don't feel any different and it just keeps going. It's never ending. That's it. That's the curse of discernment applying um, to all sorts of things in life. No. So, yeah, so Barry suggests, and, and I totally agree, agree is that we can go for stuff that is fit for purpose or does the job. It's fine. Yeah. Well, you just have to look at the success of McDonald's. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't exactly say they're high end, but they certainly fit for purpose. They do the job they deliver and the most successful That's fast right. food franchise in the world. That's right. So you also write about this idea of the great hope, great work, great waste. <laughs> Which which I, I wanted to explore. So what, what's the great hope firstly and then the great work and great waste? Yes, yeah, so this is a, if you imagine a visual model, a bit like a roller coaster, you know, at the start of a project you're, you're very optimistic, you're hopeful, you have this imaginary vision of what it's going to be like and so you set off with great hope and initially as you're working everything's really good you're doing great work but then there will come a tipping point and that roller coaster is going to start heading down where the work that you put in is going to be wasteful and and this applies to things we've heard it in the 80 20 principle the Pareto yeah. effect um, economists talk about it as the law of diminishing returns is you can put effort in but at a certain point you will start to um, reduce the return on that effort that you get. So there's a point where it's time to go live. Even if what you've created doesn't match that vision that you had at the start, you still need to put it out. Otherwise, you start wasting time and pushing yourself down to that bottom of the ladder I talked about before. Mm. You won't feel good. Mm. So I imagine this would be pretty relevant to leaders who have – identified something that needs to change and they should just start start the process. Yes. And just start doing those iterations and seeing yeah. how they go. Yeah, get the first cut done. Yeah. Instead, okay. uh, you see people working on things for days, weeks, months even, um, trying to make it better and yeah. perfect before they go live. Yeah, and I think that that's uh, what, what you said there, I think is particularly relevant to people like us who are authors because we could essentially never publish anything mm. because every time I reread my book, I don't know about you, but I think, did I write that bit? Yeah. Or I wouldn't say it like that now. <clears throat> and you could just forever continue to refine and You can. And there is yeah. no end. And that's why on uh, the inside front cover, um, it's got a list of the iterations of this book. So <laughs> the first iteration came out in October 2018 and – pretty messy looking, but it was out there and some people bought it and now this commercially available one is Iteration 5. So um, I had to take my own advice yeah. or the book would never be done. Mm. Mm. So what's this spotlight effect mm. that you talk about? Yeah, so this is a, a, a bias. You know, we, we're becoming more and more aware of biases, whether it's gender bias or cultural bias or cognitive bias. Uh, 
<clears throat> and so there's a spotlight bias which which says we think we are standing in the spotlight and everybody's, you know, looking at us and adoring us and loving what we're doing and paying attention to what we're doing. And they're not. <laughs> right? They're just not as much as we think or hope or wish. Mm -hmm. So you can let quality slip. Any surgeons, aviators, food handlers, <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking to you. Um <laughs> But this is this belief that we think people are paying more attention to us than they are, mm. and they're not. They're in their own head. They're doing their own thing. They're dealing with their own internal, you know, standards and challenges. So this is why we can let some quality slip and people don't notice. Yeah. We think they will, but they don't. So I want to follow up the spotlight effect with the pratfall yes. effect, which is yeah. something I hadn't heard of about mm. before. So what's the pratfall well, the pratfall then supports the idea of going for imperfection is that there's no point pursuing perfection that doesn't exist, so therefore we must have to put stuff out that is slightly imperfect. Ooh, yeah. Would that be a career killer? No, because of the pratfall effect. So when someone makes an error, a human error, we regard them more highly. Mm -hmm. So now we realise this thing works in reverse. If I try to look perfect, people won't regard me as highly as if I do what's called a pratfall, which is like the slip on the banana skin, right? right? So a pratfall is a fall on your behind. And so to show imperfections is something that helps uh, endear us to other people way better way better. And on um, Big Bang Theory, when Amy and Sheldon were getting married, um, Sheldon couldn't tie his bow tie. So Amy quoted to him, don't worry, we've got the pratfall effect on our side. If if, the, if this doesn't work out, you know, we will still be well, well regarded. Right. So it's let some imperfection through because yeah. people will see you in a better light. Yeah. Which I think lends itself to the idea that more and more people are wanting authenticity in their yeah. leaders and from their leaders. And as we're all human, we're all going to make mistakes from time to time, so let it shine. That's it. You, you, you list four things where people can start to ish uh, mm -hmm. in, in their approach. Are mm -hmm. you able to talk through those four? Yes. Yeah, so uh, if you think of the quality that we might pursue on something, um, so you think of, you know, in an aircraft, you can sit in first class or business class or economy or a tourist budget. You could probably go in the cargo hold if you're a dog or <laughs> a suitcase. So the quality of something is one thing. Our mindset, so we can ish on what we think about. We can ish on our activity. So imagine a chore at home, the actual activity of it. I can do it. Uh, well or do it less well and we can also ish on time so for some things near enough you know oh, what time do you want to meet up oh six ish which says a little bit before or a little bit after is okay so this is all about tolerance that that you know excellence and standards are still important but we can start to ish on quality on our mindset on time and activity Hmm. And I suppose you pair pair that with the process you have detailed in the book about the potential to ish, mm. where you sort of ask ask some questions, and I suppose that's where you'd say the brain surgeon you don't have the yeah. <laughs> the option. Are you able to sort of as much as you can talk through the the process of deciding what they can ish? Or <clears throat> what? Yeah. So I think it's it's really about whether ish would be acceptable. Um, so I talk about to ish or not to ish. And I mentioned the Takata airbag recall, you know, the, the biggest product recall in the history of the world. And a, a number of people ished where they shouldn't have. So I'm not talking about those sort of things. You know, you think of your daily life, whatever you're doing, creating something, writing a report, preparing a presentation, working on a training program, uh, getting dinner ready, tidying the house, whatever it is. Mm. That what is the tolerance here what is the standard that i can go for so think about whether ish might be doable acceptable and feasible mm. so i'm always 
uh, running that as a conversation with teams is instead of just a blanket decision, no, we can't ish, it has to be outstanding, and go, okay, let's have a little conversation about that. Is ish doable? Yes, it is. You know, is would it be tolerated? Mm. You know, would it be acceptable to do that? And and then is it a feasible thing to do, whether financially or for customers or stakeholders? I was interested in this idea of we talk about the taking from default to direct thinking. Mm. So what what's default thinking for listeners <clears throat> to start with and then how do they transition into to direct thinking? Yeah, so default thinking is uh, something we do whenever we're, we revert to a habit because yep. um, it's real easy for us to do that uh, and rather than just following that that pathway to a habit is to just pause for a minute and think and go more into what's called direct thinking. So now I'm going to actually direct my thoughts rather than defaulting to my usual thought pattern. And an example I recall was catching up with a colleague and we were looking at the work she had on. She said, oh, I've got so much on and none of it's finished. There's some default thinking right there. She said, I've got heaps more to do. So we identified what things have you actually got on and at what stage of completion are they? And she realised most of her stuff was pretty good to go and there were only a couple of tasks that needed more work from her. So we were able to switch off the default, which was I'm busy, I'm overwhelmed, there's too much to do, and we went to direct thinking, which is spending a few moments really objectively checking and then going, ah, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought. Mm. I thought it was useful to talk about uh, the foundation of of ish because I think it's something which gives, gives some context to it. So you're able to share with the, the listeners this idea of what, what the foundation of ISH is? Yeah, it's some of that down the bottom of the uh, that ladder we were talking about earlier where we're procrastinating and we're rejecting initial drafts or ideas and we're going for perfectionism. And so the procrastination problem is we don't start. Mm. We muck about and we faff about and we tidy up (laughs) rather than doing the actual work so knowing when to start is a key around procrastination and then the other end is perfectionism which is knowing when to stop so it's the starting of the task or activity and the stopping of it this is this is absolutely the foundation of if i've worked out i can ish on this thing when do i start and when will i stop Okay. And I think that's it. that's sort of important to this idea of the definition of done. Mm. So wh- when is something done? <clears throat> yeah, it's a good uh, a good definition to have. This is something I've learned from working with software developers is when they're working on a feature for an app or a feature for a website, they'll break it down into increments and they'll work on those little slices of, of work, those slices of activity. Uh, and they decide before they start working and they agree, when will we know this thing is done? Otherwise, we've got the potential to keep working on something into the wee hours of the yeah. morning um, or do an all-nighter. So defining what your stop point is is the thing to do. And so I say this happens on you know trains. You hop on a train, you know where it's going generally, unless they change it on you. Um so knowing when to start, knowing when to stop, but having that definition of done, some sort of standard that you're going for. Hmm. I thought the <clears throat> pathway to progress, how to wish mm. section of the book was was really useful. So we were able to walk walk through it just at a high level, step by step the key the key things for people to consider here. Yeah, so some of the things I think are about um kind of knowing why you you're working on something often we can embark on a project and not actually know why we're doing it and if someone stopped you and said why are you doing it Uh, you might not know Um, and of course that idea of when do I start and and when will the stop be so if we can if we can work those out that's pretty helpful Um, further along the path this standard know what the standard is that you're going for so what's this definition of done 
I reckon what happens a lot is as a leader, perhaps you might give someone a task to do and all we attach to that is a deadline, usually time. Mm. It has to be ready by next Tuesday. Yeah. So then that person's got between now and next Tuesday to work 24 hours a day. There's nothing said there about the standard. So a key in this pro- pathway to progress is know what the standard is that you're going for. So rather than it's due next Tuesday, why not say we only need three pages, a few brief notes and a couple of images and it'll be good to go. Yeah. yeah. So it's really giving some more context to what it is you're asking from them. And I think that's... That's a particularly important one for leaders because I think we can all fall into that trap of just get it done by this point and not provide the context. That's it, exactly, is setting a standard. And so then it's about, okay, we have to let it just be good enough and then test it, test it out. And so that includes, you know, creating a rough sample or a prototype and running an experiment on it. And it could be talking to someone about it or showing a customer or user or running a pilot you know, it happens in training all the time. We, yeah. we roll out a pilot and that's a prototype. I'm planning to do it next week. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd suggest we do that way sooner, yeah. right? We usually spend way too much time getting ready for the pilot when, in fact, we could do that at, do that way sooner. Um, and then, of course, we, we need to know when we're going to stop. Otherwise, we're headed for perfectionism and that's not a good place. <laughs> and I don't want you to go there. Like we, yeah. That's what we're saying. It doesn't exist. Um, and so the point is instead of going for perfectionism, if you can test some things out earlier, get some feedback on that, then you can work on another version or another iteration, as software developers say, and you just have a look at the version of an app on your phone and it will it will say version 7.148923 yeah. and that's how many times they've put you know iterations of that app out there they don't work on it and then release it yeah i, I think the reference to technology is one that everyone can grasp yeah. because everyone well generally everyone has got Sort of the either the Apple or the Samsung and the mm. apps, and they're always getting the constant updates, and right. it's just never ending. <laughs> you, you talk about this idea of sprinting and then slowing. Yes. So what's what's the what, how do we sprint and then how do we go slow? Oh, I think this is something that um, particularly athletes do very well. Is that you know, we look at your favourite sports person, they're not always playing that sport. Mm. So they perform or play their sport and then they have a rest or recovery time. And that's all I'm suggesting is instead of us working endlessly on a piece of work, set a time constraint, work diligently of it on it and then release the pressure or the constraint and either do something else or go have a cup of coffee or go for a walk. Okay. And we work better in these short sprints. Yeah. But a sprint could also be, you know, a couple of weeks. You know, it could be a two-week sprint on a particular piece of work. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it feels that you're pretty clear on the fact that you believe perfection is on the rise mm. and too many of us are already suffering from it, from it mm. and more are developing. Mm. What's driving this, this, this obsession with <clears throat> perfection and why is it on the rise? It's probably not helped by social media and our ability to compare very quickly. Uh, the perfect holidays yes. and the perfect, perfect lifestyle. Yeah, so all of those things that are being that people construct and put out there and present those images. But it's not just social media. It's also the world is, uh, you know, there's more people on the planet. There's more people vying for spots at universities. There's more people vying for job roles. Um, and so we and and we're moving through the generations. So now we've got, you know, parents who were perfectionists as children who are now passing on that value of perfectionism onto their kids. So a lot of these um, factors are coming together where we're trying to feel good and stand out. It's very easy to, as I said, become invisible. And unfortunately, perfectionism is is one of the things people go for thinking it will make them feel better but it doesn't it actually causes depression anxiety suicidal thoughts insomnia um, asthma migraines a whole range of things Mm. and if we pursued progress instead we would find and that's what i'm finding people are reading this book and 
the switch is flicking and they are changing almost immediately how they work on things yeah. and feeling better. They, their confidence is going up and they're doing less work on a project or task. Yeah. So are there any books or leaders that, uh, or people that inspire you? Yeah, I was having a little think about this and um, there's a, a team – um, that I was very impressed with a few years ago, and they created this book about design thinking, okay. and they created it over a weekend. So about four to six people, they got together, and that is a sprint. They worked together throughout that weekend, and they finished the book. Okay, so that's in contrast to many of us sitting on a book for weeks and months and years. Years. Yeah. Years. Yeah. Uh, just to sh- just to show you that yes, you can if you put your mind to it and you put that process behind you. Of they're going for good enough, and the book really is good enough. It's mm. a good one. So I find that very inspiring. And then I also find um, Dr. Richard Carlson's book "Stop Thinking, Start Living." That's something I give myself an annual read of that book. Usually when I'm on holiday to reset my mind to get out of my head and out of the judgment of myself and the judgment of my work and get into action, get into the living of life. It's times the most limited thing we have. So stop thinking about stuff and and start doing it. Okay. And if people want to find out more about you and the work that you do, where should they go? They should go to www.lynnkazaley, that's L-Y-N-N-E-C-A-Z-A-L-Y, lynnkazaley.com, and there's plenty of info there under my blog, free resources, and any of the social media. Okay. I'm, I'm there under that name. And any last words on ish and leadership? We might think, oh, I'm not a perfectionist or I'm only a bit of a perfectionist. <laughs> I like that one because that's, um, I think I might. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. And so I go, yes, hooray, you're identifying it and you're seeing that sometimes, therefore, you must ish. So I'm just saying just ish a little bit more, mm-hmm. just ish more frequently. Uh, and to, to not overlook the care and the well-being of people that you lead. So if you see someone in your team and they're not willing to share what they're working on. They're working back late. They're not taking breaks. Um, they still have to get some more information. They're still chasing up something else, that hesitance to finish something. As a leader, I'd step in and, and just reset the standard that you're expecting because uh, there could be some perfectionism going on there. Okay. So there's a responsibility as a leader to look out for this in your team and, and work in newer ways of working that that helps support progress uh, rather than perfection. On that note, Lynn, thank you so much for being part of the Sunjin Leadership Podcast. Thank you. It's been awesome. That wraps up episode 81 of the Sunjin Leadership Podcast, another author interview episode for you. I'd like to encourage you to head on over to the Sunjin Group website and engage in the conversation with us. Tell us what you liked about the episode, tell us who you'd like us to interview, or even tell us what sort of content you'd like us to put together for you. And if you are an iPhone user, please feel free, head on over to the Apple site, leave us a review. It always does really help us build awareness of the podcast. In next week's episode, we have another great curriculum ecosystem content episode for you, where I introduce you to the idea of your genius network. It's another great content episode. Until then, love to hear what you think. Happy listening.